Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villarese Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarese provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarese Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Homeowners insurance increasing or deductible too high? Call, click, or come in. Save a Dave. Dave Miette Insurance Agency. For over 48 years, Southern Tires and Auto Repair has provided services across the New Orleans metro area. Southern Tires offers a range of tires for all vehicles and ATVs. We also have a full suite of auto repair options, including brake repair, rim repair, custom exhaust, steering and suspension, tire siding, and so much more. Southern Tires and Auto Repair, 2550 Hickory Avenue in Metairie. CNC Drugs is a family-owned pharmacy that's been serving Southeast Louisiana for over 50 years. Whether you need help taking care of an elderly family member, a growing child, or even a pet, CNC provides patient-centered care for your entire family. CNC Drugs, large enough to serve you, small enough to know you. Locations in Mandeville and Araby. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher, live from our Pontchartrain Production Studios on a beautiful day here in New Orleans. Hot one, but a beautiful day here in New Orleans. And of course, a big day for um, the New Orleans Saints, big day for sports uh, as we look back at uh, what's going on with the college game, baseball. We'll talk about the Pell season. Also, we'll talk about the Saints schedule release. We'll talk about as they get ready to go to, to uh, rookie minicamp this weekend. We'll look back at the draft and to break it down for us, one of the best we have in the city. I mean, when I, when I say the guy has knowledge, the guy has knowledge. Of course, he's the vo voice of UNO Athletics. He has his own show, All Access, on 106.1 uh, FM. Uh, and also, uh, part of CrestedySports.com, and I've, I've said this before, if you're not reading CrestedySports.com on a daily basis, you're not keeping up with sports here in the city. There was a time when, again, you had you know multiple ways to be able to catch it in terms of, again, newspapers, etc. Everything now going more digital, CrestedySports.com with, again, some of the best writers we've ever had in this town. Uh, again, bringing you great news every single day when it comes to, again, prep sports, professional sports, collegiate sports. They're all over it. Jude Young joins us on the program today. Jude, how are you? I'm great, especially after that introduction. Well, that's the truth, I Jude. I mean, I, I mean, I got it's one of my favorites. When I'm not sure of something, I'll pop it on there. And, of course, I know there's a, I know there's a story. Like, again, for instance, the, um, the the track star, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, mm -hmm. from UNO, who ran the 994. I couldn't find it anywhere. I go to CrestedSports.com, there's a write-up. Right. So I knew that. I said, why don't I go there first? Because that's the kind of stuff you're going to get. But welcome to the show. Before we get started, tell everybody, everybody what you guys are involved in. Well, you really regurgitated some of what I was going to say, but okay. I do want to point out that everything we do at Crescent City Sports is free. All of our content, video, including today as we record this and do this live, is the Division I high school state semifinals, and we were fortunate enough to work with the LHSA and broadcast both of those live and free through our site and on YouTube, and also simulcast on mm -hmm. Nash Icon 106.1 FM. So if you're watching the show on a Thursday, right after it, there's a semifinal coming. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock and seven o'clock start times. Three local Catholic right. League schools involved out of the four in those games. Of course, we're covering everything from the Pelicans offseason, very interesting draft lottery next week, the New Orleans Saints, the schedule coming out and analyzing that, and the final steps they may be taking to shore up their roster for the offseason. You talked about college baseball, that about to really Ooh. heat up for a lot of Louisiana schools who have postseason hopes as far as the NCAA tournament goes. You name it, we're covering it, and of course, on All Access Tuesdays on Nash Icon, my normal night mm -hmm. uh, to come at you during the summer to get you ready for the fall when football season right. heats up again. It never ends. No doubt. Let's, um, 
let's open up with a schedule. It's been leaked. Uh, there's been over leaks earlier this week, which were again were, were, were uh, found to be again phony, fake leaks. Uh, but the leak was happened this morning, and uh, I know Will's going to put that up on the screen for you guys as well. Um, week one at Atlanta. Uh, that that is a noon kickoff here in New Orleans. Week two, Buccaneers at home. Week three at the Panthers. Week four, they travel to London to take on uh, the Vikings. Your thoughts on the first quarter of the season? It's interesting that it's heavily loaded with the division early in the season versus not as many division games. Usually expect to see three out of four late when we mm -hmm. look at that part in a little while. Uh, I, I knew because of the timing of the London game you weren't going to get a bye before or after because right? the buys don't start until week six. But uh, again, you know, early in the season you get those divisional games, you see how you measure up, it gives you a better idea of just mm -hmm. how good you are and how you need to approach things moving forward. This is an aggressive front office. This is an aggressive organization. Mm -hmm. They believe they're Super Bowl contenders in right. the NFC. So that tells them if uh, there are issues we need to fill, there's time before the trade deadline and plenty of it. But again, the London game, I know losing a home game isn't that attractive yeah. and having it at 8.30 in the morning right. local time isn't great, but we knew that going into today. And again, you've got to pay your lumps in the NFL. Everybody's mm -hmm. got to do it sometime. Uh, interesting, starting up at Atlanta, Dennis Allen, again, an Atlanta native, uh, a guy that, again, his, his dad played for the Atlanta Falcons. Interesting, again, he would, the, 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 again, the Dennis Allen era would start in Atlanta, right? right? Uh, the Buccaneers have not beaten the Saints, what, in, in, is it three regular seasons? Uh, or is it two? Four in a row against four, Tom so, Brady so in the regular so, season. Right, in the regular season. Mm -hmm. So, again, that, that is going to be circled, I'm sure, by Tom Brady and the Buccaneers when you start talking about that. Panthers, again, they caught the Saints in a COVID game last year. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, you know, if you could get out the gate – and, and winning your three uh, you know, division games, you got to leg up for the rest of the season. And who knows if you're making out right against divisional foes very early in the slate mm -hmm. because Marcus Mariota is almost certainly going to start that Falcons game, right. but you've got somebody in the <clears throat> wings, a rookie that was drafted. Right. And the same goes for the Panthers. By week three, we might not see Sam Darnold. Mm -hmm. So will you see those young options take those snaps? I don't know. You know, Desmond Ritter, I think he's a project. Mm -hmm. He'll take time. It wouldn't shock me at all if you saw Matt Corral right. week three against Carolina. So who knows there because that's going to determine how competitive those teams right. are going to be this season. Saints have done well in international games. Now again, a lot of this under Sean Payton. Your thoughts of going to London and taking on the Vikings? Vikings game, I guess it's a good pick out of the bunch because we've had so many games against the Vikings mm -hmm. recently, not too long ago, a playoff game yes. at home. You lose a little bit of that advantage in a matchup that a rivalry, but I think some of the uh, the hot, the heat has come out of that recipe a little yeah. bit in mm -hmm. recent years because of the directions <clears throat> of the two teams. But uh, they're going to be one of the more interesting teams in the NFC to watch because they do have stability at quarterback. Right. They've got some weapons on offense, but their defense has struggled. Now it's a new coach. Will they be able to improve on that side of the ball? Second quarter of the season starts with the Seahawks at home, the Bengals, uh, the Cardinals, and the Raiders. A lot of people, again, um, uh, uh, surprised that the Bengals team game is not on national television. Uh, Joe Burrow, I was surprised they didn't send that one to London. Right. I thought that was going to be the London game. Uh, but they didn't. So Seahawks, ben Bengals, Cardinals, Raiders, your thoughts? I think it would have been better off for the Saints, if not for local LSU fans, mm -hmm. that that game would have gone to London. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been a better atmosphere because there are going to be a lot of orange and black, not right. black and gold, yes. orange and black in that stadium for that noon kickoff. You're talking about Saints six. fans that are going to be pulling, I mean, sorry, LSU fans that will be pulling with Absolutely. Joe Burrow. Absolutely. No right. question about it. That's going to be a mm -hmm. big chunk of the crowd. Right. So that hurts a little bit, but not being prime time, probably mm -hmm. a little better for the atmosphere there, but you look at that bunch in general, uh, the the last two probably as tough as the Bengals, because we know the Seahawks are starting over, yes. so they, that's a game you got to win at home if you're really going to be a contender in the division and beyond, but the Cardinals on a Thursday night makes that's that more first difficult. first nationally televised right. game, right? First nationally televised game for the Saints, you get your Thursday night or out of the way. Unfortunately, you play the Arizona Cardinals in the first half of the season when they tend to be better under yeah. Cliff Kingsbury uh, than they are in the second half. So that makes that tough. And the Raiders, they went all in this offseason. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a very difficult contest. So looking through the schedule, it's why it's one of the hardest rated in the league. But you've got to make some hay when you have three out of the four in that stretch at home. Right. We all get November starts with the Ravens. Um, that, is, that is here in New Orleans. Uh, that is a Monday night football game uh, at the Steelers. Rams and then the 49ers in the third quarter of the season. Interesting that Baltimore is the only home 
primetime game in the season. Yes. Usually the Saints have three sometimes mm -hmm. in the Halcyon days, four of those. So you only get the one. Uh, we know how good the Ravens are. We know what the Steelers are going to be looking at probably mm -hmm. by then going with the rookie quarterback, their good first point. round pick. Uh, so uh, hard to uh, anticipate there, but these teams are built on defense in the running games. So that's always a tough challenge. The Rams, the atmosphere there, why that isn't in prime time, mm -hmm. I don't know. And you get a featured afternoon game against the 49ers, another team that could be in flux mm -hmm. at quarterback. I think the quarterback story around the league is going to tell the tale. With so many teams, it's hard to anticipate just how tough the matchups are going to be uh, when you face them. But I do think that that goes back to why the Saints were quick on their plan and be after Deshaun Watson. We're going to go with Jameis Winston, a quantity we know after half a season as a starter, because yes. that's going to give you an edge in a lot of these mm -hmm. games, and particularly in the first half of the schedule. Two games on the road in, that, in that, that third quarter, two games at home. Again, it is November. You'll be in, you'll be in Pittsburgh in November. There's a possibility of, again, uh, again, a bad weather game. We'll see how that kind of plays out going forward. Then again, the fourth quarter of the season at the Buccaneers to start that. That's a Monday night football game. Finally, the Saints get a bye in, in week 14 in December the 11th, and then again it is the Falcons uh, at the Browns, at the Eagles, and then of course the, 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 in, the, uh, in the 18th game of the season, it'll be the Panthers at home. You know, you would say that a Dome team, you're not doing them many favors, giving them those tough outdoor games mm -hmm. late in the season. Browns, Eagles, back to right. back in December. That's awfully tough, tough. on paper, right. but this is a Saints team that's built upon its defense I now. Agree. So that's when you have to believe in them right. and you better be sure that that offensive line that you're still questioning, is it going to be solid enough so mm -hmm. that you can control games with the running game? It's a different Saints team, but hearkening back to some in the past, maybe Jim Moore era, if Jameis Winston is too turnover prone early in the year. He may not lose his job, right. even though Andy Dalton's around, but this team may get more conservative like they were under Sean That's Payton right. with Winston mm -hmm. last year. Uh, I agree. Um, Vegas has the Saints seven, seven, seven and a half wins in the season. I think it's low. It I, is low. I think I it's very low. I think, again, if I think if you're you're a better, you run you run to your app right now and you take that all, all take that over all day long. Um, looking at the way the schedule sets up. How do, how do you think that 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 kind of uh, affects that quote unquote seven and a half? I just think that the overall quality of the schedule does make it difficult to maybe have those visions of a really high ceiling with mm -hmm. your record. I, I think the first three games are going to tell you everything. You need to be 2-1 right. and one or 3-0 and oh against divisional foes there. And if you can do that with two of the three on the road, mm -hmm. that does set you up to start thinking about what you're probably going to need to be able to win the NFC South, which is 12 games. That's, that, that's the area where you've got to get to to even think you have an opportunity to get to 12-5. and five. But after mm -hmm. that, in general, General, this team couldn't have been more un unlucky when it came to injuries and the right. big COVID breakout that cost them any chance to win a home game late in the season against Miami, and they still went 9-8. and eight. Yes. I don't think there's any reason to think this team can't get the double-digit wins because they look so strong on the defensive yes. side of the ball, and they can't help but improve in the passing game. Yeah. Assuming Michael Thomas comes back and Chris Olave, that's going to the penthouse from the outhouse oh, where isn't. they were at that position right. last year. Right. Interesting. Again, early uh, you have um, division games. Late you have division games. Right. When you look at the last games of the season, Bucks by Falcons. Uh, then the Browns and Eagles, which again, uh, they both are on the road. You match cold weather games, and then you finish up against the Panthers. Uh, the other part of this is, it's the Alvin Kamara factor. At what point, we, if at all, do, does the NFL suspend him for the off-the-field situation in Las Vegas when he got into the fight? Uh, is that going to be something they'll be able to continue to push down the road? I mean, again, some legal analysts believe that, again, uh, that with August there'll be another continuance. That'll put it maybe into December. At that point, again, maybe they'll continue this again until after the season. Also, there's a possibility of maybe pleading this down to a misdemeanor because he's never been in trouble before. And, of course, then the civil suit that'll, that'll follow no matter what that, that, that he'll have to deal with. The problem is, again, for Alvin Kamara, the NFL has the tape. They know what they've seen. We don't know what they've seen. And are they going to look and say, okay, we've seen enough. It doesn't matter what the federal, what, what the, again, local authorities do. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in the civil courts. In the court of the NFL, this is your punishment. I think because of the collective bargaining agreement and how the union works with the league mm -hmm. office on these matters to try to make it as fair as possible, the end result, you talked about a continuance on the criminal side of yes. things, likely to late in the season, and that still pushes off the civil matter. I don't think we're going to get a ruling on Kamara until 
affecting the 2023 season, okay. and I'm, I'm pretty sure the Saints are operating on that assumption. Well, let's hope point. so, because again, that would be, you know, you're talking about down the stretch, right? When, when, when and again, it happened with Deontay Hardy last year. You saw, again, the worst thing that can happen is when you're trying to make a stretch run to have the NFL putting these suspensions out there because they finally got, again, went through the appeal process, and, th and then it comes late. Right. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that you're right, that this gets pushed off and maybe into the, into the next season, if possible, depending on you know, how this goes. But again, this is a more complicated case than Hardy, than right. Lattimore as well. DUI. Because, right, and, and you're talking about right. deals that don't have a civil component, right. which really does add to the, if it's a misdemeanor in the end, pleaded down, for example, right. then based on how the civil case goes, could add to the overall decision for a punishment from the league office. So, so many components there. Pretty safe assumption right. at this point it gets pushed to next season. I like this team. Mm -hmm. I like the way this team is built right now. I think they still need another veteran wide receiver. I think they have to get another veteran running back at this point because they did not draft one. Abram Smith is a possibility, the kid from um, from Baylor. We'll see what happens with the minicamp this weekend, if he can translate what he did at Baylor to, to again, the pros. But uh, I like the way this is built. And you mentioned the defense. With Tyron Matthew now being added to the mix along with Marcus May at the safety position, you know, I look at, at this depth chart now and I see a, a really strong team on all three levels. Now, a lot of it has to do with Again, Cam Jordan coming back and being the player that he was toward the end of last year. Peyton Turner maybe breaking out. And, of course, Marcus Davenport's got to have a really good season uh, for this team. But I like him on all three levels. Yeah, I do, too. I think the big area of risk is linebacker if you don't bring Quan Alexander right. back, and that's still floating out there. Yes. Uh, otherwise, pretty strong real depth on all three levels. You have the depth on the D-line. You have the depth in the secondary. Yes. That goes a long way to get you through a season so that you can live up uh, to your capabilities. You talked about the veteran running back. I think with Sony Michelle signing with Miami, I essentially believe that if the Saints really believed in him as what was thought the best veteran running back still mm -hmm. on the open market, they would have been more aggressive and won that battle because right. Miami has more younger backs True. competing for the, the snaps there. They added Chase Edmonds, for example, in the offseason, who's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't really believe in him, this might be a situation where at that particular need, and I do believe mm -hmm. it is a need, they want to see Mark Ingram in training camp, and it might be something where we see a trade during camp, or they'll try to survive like the right Ravens did, right. who were able to pick up a Latavius Murray and sure. a couple of other veterans, right. another in Devante, uh, Smith, uh, excuse me, uh, Devante Freeman, who mm -hmm. was here, yes. who didn't work out, and those guys were instrumental in winning some games for a team that's run heavy. So I think the Saints believe they can wait on that either by trade or cuts during camp, camp right. because looking what's available now, do you really upgrade from what Ingram brought yeah. you last year? Probably Absolutely not. not. But I would agree with you. That's probably the way they're going to go. Uh, they're going to see it because we know veterans are going to get cut. But receiver, uh, again, we know that you're thinking about bringing another LSU right. guy back in How do you in feel there. about that? Look, see, you know, look I, I talk about this all the time. Because I think we get caught up, right? LSU, LSU. Right. Okay, Tulane, one low with the local guy. And it's a great story. To me, I could care less if you went to Columbia University. Agree. I just think he's a really good fit for this team right now. And one of the reasons why is, again, we don't know what Michael Thomas is going to be when he That's comes back. That's the biggest component because Jarvis Landry could start for you yes. and have Olave as a compliment and be his best version mm -hmm. of himself. He's an excellent blocker. He's tough in traffic. He yes. flat out makes plays under duress heavy contact. He's going to come down with the football. Yeah, he's not going to stretch the field for no. you, but he'll move the chains. Yes. And if you don't have Thomas, you need that. If you do have Thomas and he's your third guy and it's third and six, Jarvis Andrews going to get open. Right. He's, he's going to go coverage. Even if he's not open, right. you can throw it his way right. and there's a better chance of him making I the agree. play than the other guy. If you have that kind of component that helps you continue to put drives together that you don't have for sure right now and you can get it for the right price, right. why not? And when I look at the free agent wide receivers out there right now, there, there aren't a lot of guys that give you what he gives you. You right. met, you went blocking a guy that could catch the ball in space, those tight windows, uh, a, a guy that again I know the quarterback will have a lot of faith in. Well, he didn't have faith last year in, in, in throwing to again the lot of big lot receivers that they, they tried to sell us, right? And he even brings in a component as a gadget guy because he's one of the best receivers that have ever played the game at throwing Throw the, the football. football. That's right. He's made huge plays for Cleveland mm -hmm. in particular during his time there. 
he's a proven element. If you're trying to win right now, it makes a whole lot of yes. sense. They only spent, as far as this year's cap goes on the Teran Matthew deal, three to four million this salary right. in that range mm -hmm. when they had near 20 to spend. So they've got enough money that they can open up, work the right kind of multi-year deal if he'll take it. But even if he doesn't and you don't find any other elements mm -hmm. out there worth spending the money on, give him the one-year deal, right. throw some incentives his way, mm -hmm. which his agent might find attractive because of the Michael Thomas right. question mark. Right. And I think that might be a good deal for both right. sides. And look, uh, uh, to me, I, I look in the past it looked like they shied away from from local players. It doesn't seem that way this time around. Case in point, Tyron Matthews signed a a, a, a very very home uh, for the cap friendly hometown discount for this team, uh, and and a lot of people didn't believe he was going to going to drop down uh, and and make less money than he did last year. But he's doing it. He's right. doing it. And I think it's in part not just because of coming home, which I believe he truly had some question marks about at the mm -hmm. same time, because maybe you're better off without the bad people you know right. being right at your back door, sure. so to speak, and easier to control out of town because when you're a star athlete, the people in your background, both good and bad, probably want to benefit from you in some way. Again, just speculating, right. but... The Saints were a team that he considered in the end to be a contender, mm -hmm. that he believed, hey, this is a playoff team, to the point where I think right. he was being honest when he left after his visit before the draft when he said, I don't know if they need me. That's a compliment to how good right. he looked at the defense and thought it was, but clearly there was a hole at safety that wasn't filled during the right. draft, and they did need him, and he decided this is a place where I can win. Mm -hmm. Because at this point in his career, I know he already has a ring. He had to make that decision because he wasn't going to get the money on the highest level right. like a Marcus mm -hmm. Williams because he's not that young. Right. He's a few years older, right. and that makes a big difference mm -hmm. in front offices when they make those decisions. Yep, I'm with you. And then you look at, again, the interchangeability of May and, and also Tyron Matthew. Now you have the ability to be able to disguise that defense even more. Um, he doesn't maybe have the range that Marcus Williams has, but again, he's a guy that is a playmaker, he's around the ball, and he's a great tackler as well. I found it interesting that Dennis Allen referred to May uh, in one of the uh, draft press yes. conferences as more of a, a strong, strong safety. Right. When the numbers tell you he had his most success as At a free three. safety. And a lot of the NFL is going to mm -hmm. the too high safety mm -hmm. look. That seems to be the trend. Right. These two guys give you those interchangeable parts where yes. formations can shift pre-snap and those guys can shift into different roles on the fly and you don't lose anything. You may not have that true mm -hmm. Top end center fielder because Marcus mm -hmm. Williams is up there with the top two or three in the league as yes. far as a single high safety. Okay. But that doesn't mean there aren't different ways to do it. And Dennis Allen's probably been thinking of mm -hmm. the next evolution of his defense. You want to be a little bit more variable yeah. over time, no matter how good you've been, because eventually teams find weaknesses and learn to adjust to you. You're always trying to give them different looks, just like offenses mm -hmm. are to your defense. You mentioned Quan Alexander earlier, and, and again, I'd like to see him back as well. Look, Pete Werner may be a breakout player this year. But at the very least, we know that, again, the game is a game of attrition when it talks about the NFL. You need quality players at every single level of, of your team. He gives you a guy that, first of all, him and Demario Davis play so well together. Right. Okay? That's the first part of this. And the second part of it is, even if you're playing Warner a little bit more, uh, you have an opportunity to have a guy, that, again, that he can stay fresh for the back end of the season then. Um, I'm hoping they're able, able to get that together because he's been a very, very productive player for the Saints since he's been here. And it goes back to you're trying to win right now. Right. You don't have a true fill-in guy who's starter caliber behind mm -hmm. your two linebackers that are going to be on the field all the time. So whether it's Werner or Demario Davis mm -hmm. at this point in his career, one of those guys get hurt, you're taking a real step down based on what they have right now, at, at least in experience, even if you've got some talent that you like, like the mm -hmm. fifth-round pick. No guarantee he's going to be ready to fill in no. in any significant way. So why not shore up that last spot? Right. And look, Demario Jackson, they say he's a Demario Davis clone. Uh, DeMarco Jackson, pardon mm -hmm. me. Uh, maybe he is, but he's not going to be ready to, to this year, okay? Right. Uh, we're gonna, he's going to have to have, you know, that's a practice squad guy for right now. Uh, the same thing with Jordan Jackson, who was, the, again, the, uh, the, the, the kid out of Air Force in the sixth round. They, they say he's a great passer in, in, inside. Look, I'd love to see him be able to come in and, and compete immediately. But more than likely, he's a guy that's going to have to have a, a year of seasoning. With that said, talk about Trevor Penning as we go to the offensive side of the ball. They have a great insurance policy in James Hurst. They don't have to force this kid out there. But, look, we know 
You're picked at 19 in the first round. You got to be plug and play. Right. The question is, coming from where he is, again, uh, from the the, the uh, school he came from, playing against the competition. How will we know he's a good run blocker? How is he going to uh, fit in in terms of immediately when it comes to pass blocking and protecting Jameis Winston? I think the most important thing about him is all of the physical attributes are there mm -hmm. for Speed, him to be perfect. Athleticism, long arms. Right. You know, he's got the length you look yes. for. But the problem is because he was playing at a small school mm -hmm. that was a run heavy team didn't have great quarterback play what did they do they just mauled people mm -hmm. so he was able to get away with bad habits poor hand placement mm -hmm. uh, swinging his foot out on the outside a little early and giving himself away that on the NFL level can oh. hurt you and he was already making some progress with coaching at the senior bowl that I'm sure the Saints wanted to see it was good right. that he was getting beat sometimes yeah. because of those mm -hmm. bad habits because then they could see in a very short amount of time how he was adjusting He's too talented not to at least be a decent pass blocker, okay, for his career. Like, the floor should be dominant run blocker, decent pass yes. blocker. The ceiling could be all pro. I think they can bring him along pretty quickly, but you're right. Because of Hurst, they don't have to rush right. it. They can almost pretend like what we've seen with Teron Armstead right. over the years. He's going to miss some games, right. right? Well, Penning may miss them because of not being ready yet. But by midseason, it would be a surprise if they haven't thrown him out there. Right. And in part because I think they really do want to run mm. the ball, and he's got the ability to be dominant. He was the first player that PFF said ever graded out 99.9% .9 on run blocking mm. for his career. Right. That is ridiculous on any level, and he's a mauler there, and that can give the Saints a component that I think is really going to fit their new right. head coach. And if he doesn't start immediately, he becomes the tackle eligible. Sure. Will Clapp is now gone. He's, at, he's with the Los Angeles Chargers. There, there's an opening for that, for that there if they want to utilize him there. Chris Olave looks like a plug-and-play player, like he's going to come in and, and, and immediately again uh, uh, be the deep, deep threat. But people underestimate his ability to run routes. Right. Uh, again, uh, when you look at the scouting report on him, one of the things that they talked about was it, when the, the, the receivers that were coming out this year, he was probably the best route runner of, of, of the group. With that said, they did give up five picks to get him. Uh, talk about the, the cost. Talk about in terms of him this year. Well, let's get to the cost because you're talking about giving up second day picks and an early third day pick right. in order to maneuver to get mm -hmm. the receiver you needed to get. But you also have to take in the financial component mm -hmm. because big time receivers were going for over Michael Thomas's current contract. That's right. You thought you were paying him a lot at right. 20 million. Guys like A.G. Brown getting 25 mm -hmm. now because you have to have difference makers at receiver now. And the Saints with their salary cap situation because good or bad moving forward, they're married to Thomas for at least a couple more years. Mm -hmm. They had to find a cheaper option Option to add to their starting lineup and that was the way to do it cheaper not on draft capital right. side but in the salary side and as far as the player so I'm defending it to a certain extent mm -hmm. even though I get where people are saying unnamed sources mm -hmm. around the league are saying the Saints don't value their draft right. capital well enough but at the same time I'll get to that point where I understand why they feel that way based on their success in the past in a minute but as a receiver the thing about Olave is that he is plug and play, and he's the closest thing to Brandon Cooks coming out that you know is going to be a starting wide receiver. Is he going to be a number one superstar? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but is he going to be a guy who's a tough cover that mm -hmm. is going to be hard for teams to justify single covering because he can make the big play? Uh, he's so much like Cooks, even with his weaknesses because of the way he's built, although a little bigger. He's not a great open field guy. The Saints thought they got a guy when they drafted Cooks that they could throw hitches and wide receiver screens to and he make plays right. in space. That's not who he is. Right. He is a true wide receiver route runner, sharp cuts, gets open, has the deep speed. So the Saints have guys around from that era, of course, starting with uh, P. Carmichael, mm -hmm. who know how to use him. Yes. And it's exactly what they were mm -hmm. missing, that component who's going to step right in and you don't have to teach him a lot to be successful about what they're going to ask him to do. That's why it made sense, even though they may look back and say Jamison Williams winds up being the more dynamic mm -hmm. guy. He's hurt and he's not as polished right. at what the Saints needed. And they're trying to win right now. Mm -hmm. Say what you like about winning right now when you're talking about using high draft picks. Pelicans are going to be a big story as far as what they True. do with their Absolutely. lottery pick coming up. But the Saints are looking to win right now, and they did something that they could afford mm -hmm. to do with their salary cap issues. Um, Alante Taylor, mm -hmm. second round, 
uh, a lot of people had him as a as a fourth round pick, third round pick. He went in the top 50. Um, they love his measurables, and look, I love his measurables. Yeah. Uh, the only question I have is again the the value of the pick. Um, you know. Um, but from that standpoint, he's going to get every opportunity to make it on special teams, and it gives them another player that they're grooming in that secondary. The only value of a pick that matters is the Saints board in their draft right. room. They might have had him higher than most of, if not mm -hmm. all the teams in the league. But keep this in mind, when you're reading all this draft prep information mm -hmm. and hearing these analysts and experts, who aren't working for NFL teams. Yep. They are telling you one thing from their connections. Most years, there's anywhere from 15 to 25 true first-round grade Agreed. guys. And this past draft, after that drop-off, that was no more than 20, according to most, you had such a glut that it really went all the way through the top 100 picks mm -hmm. as to where a guy's value based on how he fits in on a team and what the vision is. Taylor's an extremely good athlete. And I love the fact that even though Dennis Allen says he's a corner, right. their vision is clearly for him to be at least the third corner, I think, year two of his career mm -hmm. when they move on from Bradley Roby. That's what I think they're yes, planning to do. The fact that his floor, because he's such a good tackler, so he's going to be <clears> so good on special teams right away, is that he could wind up being a starting safety for you eventually right. for a long time like how Malcolm Jenkins worked out in the league uh, they agree. thought he was going to be a corner right. they quickly saw okay so the worst end of the scouting report mm -hmm. is there and he winds up being a great right. safety for a long time I think Taylor's going to be yeah. that guy because making plays being physical and using his athleticism mm -hmm. on that side of the game versus using the speed and the length and being able mm -hmm. to cover receivers downfield he's more advanced in that area yeah. already former quarterback former wide receiver and a guy that played four years of uh, of cornerback at at, at the uh, at, at Tennessee. All right, rookie minicamp this weekend. Uh, there, there are some undrafted free agents that the Saints went out and gave bonuses to to to, to get those guys. Abram Abram Smith is one of those guys. Uh, Rashid um, uh, Rashid uh, Shahid out of Weber, Weber State is another one. Uh, Deshaun Dixon, a guy you know a little mm -hmm. bit about from from Nichols, is a guy that's a wide receiver. Lewis Crow out of Pittsburgh, tight end. Uh, also, again, uh, Smoke um, Monday was given a, uh, uh, a bonus, as well as Lewis Kidd, uh, the offensive lineman out of Montana State. Your thoughts on some of these undrafted free I agents? I think the best thing to mention <coughs> when we talk about value of your actual draft picks, right. especially day three, comes up here when we look at these UDFAs. Would anybody have flinched if the Saints would have taken Abram Smith, no. Smoke Monday, no. with their fifth round pick? No way. So how valuable really are those late-day right. picks? Because it's a crapshoot at that point anyway, right. and the Saints have found so many values in undrafted free agency. Especially when you look at Monday as a versatile safety, you're going to ask to come in and be a special teamer. And if that's all he is in your fourth safety, mm -hmm. maybe he allows you to move on from JT Gray a year early than a year late, right. and he can be better in playing snaps because he's a better overall safety than him. <laughs> those are the type of moves you look at. Undrafted free agents, just like on CrescentCitySports.com mm -hmm. on the front page, Right now, Rene Nato asked the question, can Abram Smith be the next Pierre Thomas? Right. Who's to say he can't? And mm -hmm. if you're getting that kind of value in an undrafted guy, it tells you just how deep the talent pool is in a given year coming out and how late round draft picks probably don't mean as much. Smith has a great chance to make the I team agree. because he played one season at linebacker before just one year as a starter this past year. 1,600 yards rushing, really good in one year as a starter in the Big 12. Mm -hmm. But the year before, starting four games at the end of the season at linebacker and averaging 11 tackles per game great at athlete. a position you're not – great athlete, and the fact is – he fits the third running back profile, even if he's not going to beat out two veterans ahead of him, and he makes you a better overall football team. Love picks like that. Special teams again comes up, and Rashid Shahid. I think that guy, once right. you look at his profile mm -hmm. and his highlights, he could be somebody who winds up being better than Deontay Hart. Right especially as a receiver mm -hmm. and somebody you put out there to stretch the field. His production at a higher level than Hardy, mm -hmm. who's he's a bigger player than mm -hmm. Hardy. He's just as good, if not better, as an open field guy. And those are the guys you can get on the street. Yeah. The Saints right. have proven it time and time again. That group's going to be fun to watch that you mentioned. Yeah, I agree. What about Dixon from Nickel State? Everybody's asking about him. He's a really polished receiver. Mm -hmm. He's not a guy who's going to stretch the field, so he's more possession receiver guy. He did so in college, mm -hmm. yes, but looking at how he profiles to the next level. But there's no reason to 
think that he can't at, meet, at least meet the uh, practice squad requirements right. of this team. I agree. I look at him as somebody who's got more overall talent than a little Jordan Humphrey who mm -hmm. stuck around for a while. Mm -hmm. And Nichols ran the ball a lot, too, especially this past year right. because the quarterback play as far as passing game wasn't as good. This guy's big and physical, 6'2", 6'3", likes to block. Yep, no doubt. Plus of information from Jude Young today here on, on Inside New Orleans Sports. All right, we break a little bit later than normal. We come back, we'll talk some Pels, we'll touch on the breakers, we'll jump into some college baseball. We have time, we'll talk about spring football, both LSU and Tulane, all that coming up here on Inside New Orleans Sports. Jude Young, CrestedSports.com, 106.1 FM is our guest. I'm Eric Asher. We'll be right back. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration has been family-owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy-efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi ductless AC units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the Best of Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. June Young of CrestedSports.com, 106.1 FM, is our guest. Catch his show every Tuesday night following my show, All Access, on, uh, on again, 106.1 FM. All right, let's get to the Pels. Uh, great season, considering again how they started, 1-12, 3-16. and Lost to the Suns 3-2 in, in the first round of the playoffs. Um, they made great strides throughout the season. Uh, they look like a team that can be a real contender for next year. Big question, obviously, is again, what's going to happen with Zion Williamson uh, going forward? They have the eighth pick in the draft right now, a 26% chance of moving up into the top four, 6% chance of moving into the, into the top spot. Um, let's first of all, why don't you give me your synopsis on the season that was? season that was couldn't have started worse and couldn't have ended better based on the start. You play without your superstar the whole year. You survive a 3-16 and 16 start and Willie Green shows you you made the right decision mm -hmm. as a coach, short term, long term and your future's so bright and it all happened because look a lot of things happened. We know CJ McCollum trade is big but it really came down to the idea that you were able to get three rookies to step in and prove that they are part of your rotation right. moving forward. To prove it, you mm -hmm. don't have any questions. It's now just a matter of how much better those guys are going to get. Uh, you know, Alvarado being that perfect second unit mm -hmm. sort of guard off the bench who can bring you uh, that playmaking, a team that needs to get better defensively, he brings it. Herb Jones, his defense speaks for itself. At this point, he's an unquestioned starter. It's right. hard to see anything happen in the offseason no to change that. And, you know, having Murphy develop slowly mm -hmm. wound up working for the best because it got Jones the experience mm -hmm. early, and Murphy learned what he needed to do and showed that he could respond to coaching and demand and yeah. going back and forth between the team mm -hmm. and the G League. And he brings the shooting you want. Apparently, he posted that he's now 6'9". Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So he's got the link that you want as a 3 and D wing who could develop his game to get even better. And you have that all filling around mm -hmm. Brandon Ingram finding himself even more as a pro, even though he'd already been an all-star, best season yet, still in his mid-20s. It all fits together with McCollum's leadership setting the tone. The best part of it is not just what happened during the season. You talk about getting Williamson back. A top eight, nine, maybe top four pick. Right. Pelicans don't have to do anything else but make that draft pick. If right. they don't want to, make that pick, get Zion back, go into the season, and believe they're at least a playoff mm -hmm. team in the Western Conference and maybe a whole lot more. If you'd have told us... 12 months ago, they'd be in this position. Yeah. Nobody would have believed it. No, I would agree. All right, let's talk about, first of all, about Zion. Uh, he said he couldn't run, get fed, go, he couldn't sign the, the extension fast enough. Uh, but yet, Griff says that he wants Zion to concentrate on getting healthy, but the extension is going to be a challenge. Look, I'm just looking at it from a business standpoint. 
Uh, I'm putting protections in for the club. He missed 118 games. He's played 85 in his career. Uh, for most of it, it's been tumultuous. Doesn't want to be here, this and that. Look, he sees a good thing now here. Sure. Okay? Uh, but again, if I'm the club, I'm protecting myself. The question is, will he sign something like that? I think he's going to have to give in and sign something along the lines of the deal you just mentioned that Joel Embiid you know I mean? had to agree that, exactly. to. Exactly. Now, the thing is, it's probably going to work out even on that level that Embiid did because there were real question marks about whether he could stay healthy and it had nothing to do with how he was taking mm -hmm. care of himself right. and Zion's a different story. I don't know if I trust his maturity and mm -hmm. I know David Griffin and the front office don't. At the same time when you have a legitimate superstar, game changer, a guy that when he's on the court and healthy is competing to be all NBA first team. Right. You've got to roll the dice to some extent with him. But sure, there's got to be a negotiation there. And something where in the end, because your roster is so good and you can believe mm -hmm. you can be good for a long time, that you have a way to escape mm -hmm. if you need to in a, maybe two, three years right. is something they should be working for. How's the fit? How's the fit with Zion coming back? I think it's fine because I trust Green. I right. think he's going to be able to get the most out of him. A lot of speculated, and I agree with this, that in order not to take the ball out of Brandon Ingram's hands too much and make him an unhappy player, right. perhaps to get what you need throughout the first three quarters of the game, it's pretty easy to stagger both of them so that Zion, for example, you should be a great second quarter team because mm -hmm. I would think Zion plays early and is the first of the true stars in the lineup to come out and he right. comes back in late first quarter mm -hmm. and leads the second unit whereas they're staggered enough that who's hot last mm -hmm. five minutes of yeah. the game when the game is on the line that guy's going to get the ball more where's the matchup okay. against the team you're facing defensively that's the problem you want to mm -hmm. have and I think they'll be able to coexist get their numbers and get in their rhythm because I trust Willie Green to make the right decisions there it's unfair for me to ask you uh, what they get with their pick because again it could be eighth it could be ninth it could be a top four and there's a big there's a difference in the players that are available during that time but let's just say this is a very good draft top ten sure it is so they're going to get somebody that can help them in some respect if they draw a top four pick the chances go way up that they can wind up getting a really special guy right and that makes the decision even harder at that point because you've got to rank these players and you can't draft based on nice safe fit right you got to say who do I think is going to be the best player the mm -hmm. best asset mm -hmm. moving forward when this is a luxury pick mm -hmm. based on how the rest of your team is already right. built sure you could look at it and you draw a top let's say you draw the number two overall mm -hmm. pick you could look at it where you're deciding you know Jabari Smith jr. is a better fit for us mm -hmm. right now because he helps space the floor mm -hmm. at 610 and looks more versatile defensively but Paulo Bancaro might be the better player right and even though he doesn't fit as well because he's going to need the ball at the power forward position like Zion, mm -hmm. should we pass him up if we really have him graded significantly higher than Smith or the next option? True. Those are going to be the tough of, right. type of tough decisions they're going to have either there or even still, say, mm -hmm. if they're number eight or number nine. Maybe you like this wing, a 3 and D wing, whether it's uh, Benedict Maturin out of Arizona, right. A.J. Griffin from right. Duke. But say you think Dyson Daniels out of the G League was more of a point guard type who, who – you know, if he improves his shooting just a little bit defensively and running a team mm -hmm. and making things happen, he has a little bit of that Chris Paul in him. He mm -hmm. has a little bit of that Jason Kidd. Maybe you think you got to take him, even though you've already got three point guards mm -hmm. on your roster, right. counting McCollum with the two young guys, yes. uh, including Lewis coming back from the ACL. Mm -hmm. So that makes it tough. Do you go and take the best guy, even though he might not be the best fit? I think they should do that, mm -hmm. but it'll be really interesting no matter where they pick, what the decision-making process winds up being and what they say after the draft, after they pull the trigger. Larry Nance, in the last year of his deal, do you extend him? Yes, absolutely. He was more than a throw-in. Mm -hmm. He's somebody that helps you match up with the four and the five. He brings toughness. He doesn't need the ball. He can defend and he can rebound. And because I don't think Jackson Hayes is too much longer for this team. That was my next question. Yeah. It's a perfect fit to keep him around, and he needs some veterans who have been there mm. through the league, not just a McCollum. Having a few guys in their early 30s for the mm. next two or three years, that brings that locker room stability that these other young stars mm. are going to need. So you're willing to give up on Jackson Hayes? I am, yes, because okay. I don't – at this point, his maturity is an even bigger question without the upside of Zion Williamson. Mm -hmm. And when you take a guy, and that's another factor here to this right. lottery pick that mm -hmm. happens to be slotted right yes. now at eight, which is where he was picked, number right. eight overall. Once those guys get to 
to the next contract. If they're not earning big money, they don't stay on those teams. Right. And Jackson Hayes hasn't earned the type of money to be making well over $20 million a year. So that's an investment he's going to get overpaid based on who he is and what he's produced and maybe even his upside. Somebody else needs to do that, not the Pelicans. Snell's in the last year of his deal. They have his bird rights. I think he, they move on from him. Sure. Uh, is, is there a buyout with Garrett Temple? Does he move into the into the front office or get uh, on the coaching staff? Or do they buy him out and let him go ahead and try to find another, another team? I think because unless they see a deal they can't refuse, they're not going to be aggressive trading for another piece. Mm -hmm that keeping his salary, what is it, around the $5 million yes. range as part of a package that could lead to the next C.J. McCollum-like deal come mm -hmm. the trade deadline. I think that's probably the route they're going to take, just like I don't believe that they're jumping off of Devontae Graham that too was soon. Next question. Because you pair those salaries together, and then you go ahead and so you're add looking somebody toward else. the trade deadline sure. to utilize those guys to move on and maybe bring another piece and in. get another piece in where you can take back up to 125 percent of the salary you're sending out it right. could be that six man that backcourt player that you don't get right now that can help you win in the playoffs how good can this team be next year bringing zion back getting getting a lottery pick willie green his second year top top of the west competitor if mm -hmm. everything goes right, right who's to say they can't win 60 games mm -hmm. sir i know it, no, no, I'm, I'm but it's you. time to go there right. I, I don't think people should uh accept the concept of well they're going to take the next step and they can be top four that's a bunch look, of nonsense look at you either have it or you don't when you're ready you're ready and right. this team could easily be ready next year and that should be their goal they should be thinking we should be the number one seed this mm -hmm. year because they look a whole lot better as a team that got in as the nine seed mm -hmm. against the number one seed than the team in the next round who has a superstar and Luka right. Doncic talking about Dallas has looked against Phoenix right. there's a reason for that and again that's without Zion right no, no doubt about it I'm with you uh, good things ahead for the New Orleans Pelicans. All right, quickly, I want to talk about the USFL and the Breakers. They're now 3-1. and one. Uh, they, um, they they beat the Houston Gamblers 23-10, 10, 10 points in the final two, minute, in the final two minutes. Fedora seems like he's a pretty good, on good coach. Uh, the front office looks like they're putting out a pretty, pretty, they have a pretty good team. They got the Generals on tap on Saturday. Talk about your thoughts about this team thus far. The, I've watched enough of it to know that based on the weird stagger they had in the draft for yep. position, that they've done pretty well with Kyle Slaughter as quarterback, even though they picked last right. amongst the eight teams right. amongst the available Number one in the USFL. Yeah, number one in passing yards, even though he hasn't been that impressive. Right. I think it might be more the offensive line in mm -hmm. general has been inconsistent, mm -hmm. but they've got playmakers at receiver, and they've been really good on defense. So that makes them, because they bear the New Orleans name, yes. even though it's sort of weird, empty it stadium, weird. middle right. of Alabama, oh, right? Crazy. It's something that if they have a really good season, that I think they will draw fans at a place like Yulman next mm -hmm. year where you think they would play. It's going to succeed for another right. year because Fox owns it. Yes. Fox made it a made-for-TV event, and it's doing well enough in the ratings already mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to sell the advertisers to take the next step. And it's going to be really interesting to see what they draw next year. Right. Whether they win the USFL this year mm -hmm. or not, it's going to be a weird decision it, for right. fans. Well, I'm going to say right now... <laughs> It's, 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 look, people are, are, are um, spoiled by being in an air-conditioned dome. Mm -hmm. Playing spring football in, in, in the heat at Yeoman mm -hmm. is going to be a challenge. But if they're winning, there's going to be a segment of the population, uh, of the sports population, that's going to go and see them play. There's no, you there's know? no doubt about it because people love football. Right. Here. That's exactly it's right. It's a winning New Orleans team that's getting right. national TV games. They're, they're, it takes care of I itself. Agree. All right, let's switch to baseball because I want to try to see if we can hey, squeeze in a little bit of um, spring football. Oh man, the, the Southland. I'm going to go there. No, I'm gonna, <laughs> but I mean, the Southland is so tight right now. Um, 12 and 9, McNeese and SLU, and then there's UNO, Nichols, Northwestern, uh, Houston Baptist, all at 11 and 10. Uh, a and M, Corpus Christi, 9 and 12. Uh, Incarnate Word, 7 and 14. Talk about the. Talk, it's a log jam with what? This is the last weekend. Last of, weekend, of, three games. They'll be and, done. And, and then a, a new format for the tournament as well, right? And that's what makes the top two so valuable. Mm -hmm. Even if you, you don't wind up being the number one seed, there's almost certainly going to be a tie for the title. Right. How big is that tie going to be? But the format I think the Southland went to is what all smaller leagues should do that tend to be one bid leagues. Mm -hmm. There'll be four NCAA first round regional style sites. Mm -hmm. Top two seeds will host. Double elimination. Winner of those two regionals the next week go on and play a best two out of three to determine the champion. You don't have this weird setup where you mm -hmm. throw eight teams together like they have in the past. Yep. The loser's bracket turns out to be a mess where the final score mm -hmm. is 18 to 17. People don't have pitching. That won't be as much of a factor now. And that league 
I don't know. Throw them into a hat. Even those teams at the bottom that have losing conference right. records. I called those UNO games mm -hmm. home get series recently. If you told me those teams wound up winning the automatic bid and got hot for two weekends, mm -hmm. the two worst teams in the league on mm -hmm. paper wouldn't shock me in the least. Right. Your guess is as good as mine. So if you want to see up in the air competitive baseball where all the games matter, the Southland from this weekend on into the postseason for two weeks is going to be a blast to watch for a baseball right. it's good. I love the Southland because of that. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It really is. And a really good baseball league right now, as it normally is as well. Um, let's talk about LSU. 33 and 15, 14 and 10. Um, your thoughts, they, they, they win the Alabama series. They got two series left. Uh, they're 16th now in, in the RPI. It looks like they're going to host a, a sub-regional if things go right. What are your thoughts? Well, the things going right part is what you need to determine at this point. Obviously, nothing's set in stone. 14 and 10 in the league is the key mm -hmm. number. If they wind up with at least 17, you play 30 conference games, they've got the six yes. left. If you win at least 17, pretty good chance LSU mm -hmm. hosts. They can get to 18 then pretty good chance they stay out of the way of the buzz saws at the top of college baseball mm -hmm. right now. Tennessee, which has been an absolute monster right. this year. Oregon State, you don't want to be matched up with them. Uh, you can potentially get all the way to a top eight seed if you do even better than that. But this weekend is the key because you get an Ole Miss team that's playing a little better lately and right. lost a lot of close games. But still, you've got to at home, your final mm -hmm. home league series, win at least two out of three because the final series is at Vanderbilt. Yeah. They're not quite the Vandy they've been in recent but years, Vandy. but they're still a tournament team. They're still really good. Right. They're still tough to beat on that turf at home. So LSU needs to get to 3-3 three and three at least in these final games. If they do, I think they're hosting. Yeah, and that, which is a key for them going forward. The pitching is a is an issue. It's, it's, it's not good. And what Jay Johnson in his first year right. has done to piece it together, it's been a great job. Right. They're much more reliever heavy. They can get two or three good innings mm -hmm. out of guys much more than outside of what Mikhail Hilliard's been a godsend coming That's back, great. you know, getting five or six. So they're still piecing it together. Right. I, we don't know as of right now, unless they've released mm -hmm. it, who they're starting in their Sunday game or right. Saturday game this weekend yes. yet, much less Sunday. But they can hit. And if it's a close game late, they've got good one or two inning guys mm -hmm. that have gotten them over the hump more often than not the last six weeks. I don't know how far they can go in the tournament because teams that don't have enough pitching tend to get exposed. Right. Injury to Jacob Berry. It hurts, but it sounds like they're going to be careful with it because they do have enough depth in their lineup, and they'll be able to get him back full strength, you would think, by the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fracture of the middle hair finger, line, hairline. Yeah. It's yeah. not that big of a deal, and it really only affects him. Because you can DH him, which right. actually probably makes LSU better defensively. Mm -hmm. yes. The only That's reason he point. came here, mm -hmm. the promise of being able to play a position. Uh, I assume that he can hit. I, I believe he can hit still right-handed. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, again, yeah, that limits you because it's more righties mm -hmm. than lefties you're going to face as far as pitching goes. But I think if they have to be super careful with him, they will, and he'll be 100% by the postseason. Tulane 29-19 and 1-10-8. It looked like they were going to have a chance at, at getting into the tournament. It now looks like they've got to win the AAC. Right, they blew it again. Look, they beat ECU two out of three at home, and you're right there. You can win the regular season. You can move your RPI up into the at-large range, and then they lose consecutive series, Central Florida, and then Cincinnati. And I hate to say but you blew it because you know what you've got to do to be in that spot right. so you don't have to win the tournament. There's a lot of grumpy Tulane fans and, about Travis Jewett, right. and they're not going to want to hear the excuses because injuries have hit them again. Mm -hmm. There may be even an eligibility concern, some of the rumor right. mill is saying, to That's, a starter. Mm -hmm. So... That's not going to work in year six. And I don't care how much the AD that hire him, Travis Dannon, may like him and want it to work out. If they wind up fizzling Quietly out the rest extended of the way. Him. Yeah, I know. I know. Trying to help the recruiting side right. of things. Tulane has the money in this case to right. deal with it. Fans care most about baseball. That's right. Period. Right. And you've got to win. And they're sitting in fourth place in the conference right now when they should be a team that's battling for the top. With you. I think a change is coming soon. Congratulations to Delgado. Once again, uh, Region 23 champs. Uh, they Again, they got uh, the 12th uh, consecutive uh, uh, title. Uh, the 15th in the last 16 seasons. 35 and 14. Joe Sherman's got a juggernaut over there uh, by City Park. As always, and he develops players for the next level.
and right. that's why he keeps getting solid players. But shout out the Nunez. Mm -hmm. They beat him by one right. run in the no, championship game. Right. Already beat him one time mm -hmm. in that tournament. This is a program that hasn't existed right. for three years. That's a great point. I'm glad you said that. So give the give them a big shout out. They're the mm -hmm. Pelicans too, by yeah, the way. So the right. rise of the Pelicans in New Orleans <laughs> hey, or in this area is real. All right, let's let's talk. We got we got about uh, two minutes that we can throw through, go through this. LSU spring. Everybody's talking about the quarterback position. Your thoughts. Boy, is it wide open. It is. Who would have thought that Garrett Nussmeyer would be such a true I, I contender didn't. for the job? And I think it's a great thing. You want as many viable right. options at the most important position as possible. But at the same time, if he really starts winning out, you're going to potentially face mm -hmm. the top two guys you thought as far as the most experienced guys, maybe both deciding to leave, right. especially because of the fact that Brennan could leave in uh, August as a grad transfer. Right. So then your depth disappears. Right. I don't think that's going to play into the decision. Either. He's going to pick the best guy. And in the end, I'm going to guess that the safe pick, it won't be much of a separation not to pick Miles Brennan, at least mm -hmm. to start things out. And there's a vision for Daniels and his mm -hmm. mobility to be a package guy. Right. Not the physical runner like a Taysom Hill with the Saints package guy, right. but because of his movement ability, throwing on the run, speed running the uh, read option, uh, he'll play a little bit too. I feel like a, a broken record here with Tulane. But really, the big story is the the transfers that that again that that, that are that are, have high school uh, that have been here from New Orleans high schools that came back to play at Tulane, which really have have really augmented that lineup. It is a better lineup now with those guys that came come there, in. There's no doubt about it. You have more talent to try to be able to match up in a conference that's also bringing in higher level transfers right. that are coming it's down true. who can really right. play. So it makes it much more of a toss up from mm -hmm. one year to the other. The key is, and I say it every year, this is a league where you got to score points. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while a team emerges and we know what Cincinnati did but can't expect that to continue but and in the end you got to be the team if you're the top scoring team in the league you're probably contending for the title you got to keep up with the UCF's Houston's SMU's of the world and Tulane needs to have the development of quarterback with Michael Pratt and protect him as a passer yes. in order to take advantage of pretty good skill talent uh, Tajay Spears, of course, still keeping him. I right. thought he might have been a transfer guy, but he's happy there. That's a big keeper. They need to score points. They need to win a couple of shootouts to be the difference between struggling to be bowl eligible and really taking a step forward. And after a miserable season, yeah. they really do need to at least this be a This needs bowl to be team. a bounce-back season. No doubt. Them. Okay, and, and look, I don't think Willie Fritz is going anywhere, but at the same time, they've got to, it's got to be a bounce-back season this, this, this past season. Right, now, I don't believe there's going to be pressure beyond that, but it no. does start to affect your recruiting. It does. And the gains that they've made across yeah. the Gulf South with mm -hmm. Fritz and his right. And I do like what they're doing in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. Again, giving, well, again, former Louisiana high school, especially New Orleans area, a chance to come back home. Right, right. That, that augments what you already have. Right, exactly. But the guys like Spears and Pratt, those are guys you sign out of mm -hmm. high school and you yep. develop and you make them into something. And they have to be successful enough to wind up being first and second day draft pick consideration yep. type guys. They have the talent. Will they play that way? Jude, tell everybody about your radio show. Tell us about CrestySports.com. Um, let, let them know about all about it. Tuesday nights on 106.1 FM at 6 o'clock following Eric Asher's Inside New Orleans, as well as what we do at CrescentCitySports.com all year round. Check out the site. Follow it. State High School Baseball semifinals today. Whenever you're watching this show on a Thursday, although you'll see it in, in multiple days, live on CrescentCitySports.com, free video, and on Nash Icon 106.1 FM. So please check that out. Always great to have you, my friend. Thanks Likewise. so much for joining us. Jude Young, CrescentCitySports.com. All right, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, so many ways to catch our program. There is a QR code that's up on your screen. You, you can hit it and um, with your, uh, click with your phone, and then, of course, it'll take you to WLA TV YouTube page, also to my website as well. But a lot of ways they'll catch our program. That's up on the screen right now. Also, you catch me on, on the radio, 106.1 FM, weekdays 4 to 6. Uh, you can listen live at uh, ericasher.com. Also, again, our Anchor is our home base for our uh, podcast. Uh, there are digital platforms you can catch us as well. So a lot of ways to be able to catch the program. Also, I uh, want to thank our underwriters for making our show possible, as well as the WLE production staff. We do a great job of producing this program each and every week. Uh, they, they include, again, um, Alex Chacon, uh, Logan Grafia,
Uh, and my director, William Hill. Also want to thank Ron Yeager and Jim Dotson, part of, again, the LA group, WLE group here as well. Uh, been, a great, uh, been a great week. Looking forward to now, again, with the draft lottery next week, mini camp this week. Uh, a lot going on with the home teams. We'll talk about it all over again next week. Uh, Mike Dettelier will be our guest next week on the program. I'm Eric Asher for Jude Young. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. Thanks for joining us.